Welcome to SCP-105. This is our fifth lecture that's virtual. So far, we've been exploring the origins of life, the different chemicals that are required for life, and how life began on Earth and has evolved over billions of years into what we now see around us today. And in the laboratory, we've been looking at some forms of life that are different from what we might be expecting life to look like and have different characteristics and properties. And the thing that we're trying to decide is whether we might be able to find strange forms of life outside of the earth. Now, this is a difficult question to answer and we need to be able to have lots of tools to do it. We have some tools in the form of knowing what forms life takes, what the different things life is made out of, what life does, and how life exists on Earth. But now we want to look more carefully at what the different conditions there are in space. We live here on Earth, at a nice temperature, with a nice climate, in an atmosphere, with the right amounts of chemicals for life to be the way we see it around us. But in other places, things might look very different. So to understand some of this, what I'm gonna ask you to think about today is some of the fundamental ideas about how things work. This is the subject of physics. We want to know, for example, why our planet has the temperature that it does and what we might expect on other planets in terms of their temperature. We want to know what the different pieces of information we can get about distant worlds are and how we can learn about them. And mostly we learn about them by looking at the light that comes from them. So that's what we'll be discussing today. We'll be discussing light. And light has both the property of warming up planets like our own from stars, like the sun, and also has the property of sending us information here on earth from distant worlds. So to really understand light, is a way for us to really understand what the possibilities for discovering life in the universe might be. So we start off with a view of light. Light is a little bit of a confusing subject for thousands and perhaps even tens of thousands of years, human beings have been thinking about what this thing we say is light and what it could possibly be. There have been a, many different ideas about this. Some of the more famous ideas have been associating light with eyes, since we see and we say the things that we're seeing as light, there have been some people that thought in the past that it was the eye that provided light. We now know that light exists whether or not there are eyes in the world. We can measure light with different devices. And we know how our own eye receives light and how it interprets light and that light is a separate thing from the eye. Light is something that is produced by matter. And we're actually going to learn a couple different ways that matter can produce light. There's actually more ways that matter can produce light that, uh, than we will discuss. Uh, but we'll discuss two very important ways for the purposes of our interests. Much of the light we see around us in the everyday world comes from the sun. But now with the advent of artificial lights 
And ever since human beings invented fire, for example, we've been able to create different forms of light using different chemicals or different situations. We'll try to make a connection between the way we might make light uh, artificially and how the sun produces light and how other objects might produce light. The first thing I'd like to start with is this view of how light changes as I move towards it or move away from it. And of course, one of the first things we notice when we have a source of light and we get closer to it is that the light is brighter. And as you get further away, the light becomes dimmer. But one of the most remarkable things about this is that the light doesn't become dimmer simply by multiplying the distance that you have traveled away from it and saying, okay, if I move two times further away, I'll find the light to be two times as dim. Or if I get twice as close, I'll find the light to be twice as bright. If you ask many people, they think that that's the way light must work. If I get twice as close, the light will be twice as bright. I get 10 times closer, it'll be 10 times brighter. But that is not actually how light behaves. Light, in fact, changes by the square of the distance. So that if I move two times closer to a source of light, it will be four times brighter. And if I move twice as far away, the light will be reduced to 25%, one quarter of its brightness. This is called the inverse square law. And it's something that was not really appreciated until about 400 or 300 years ago when people really began to be able to study carefully how much light was produced at different distances and how much was observed at different distances. It took people a long time to figure this out. But when they did, it did make some amount of sense. It may seem a little bit strange when you first hear this, that light reduces by the square of the distance, the so-called inverse square law. But let me show you a diagram that illustrates why this might be something that makes a bit more sense. So this diagram is imagining light as rays emanating from some source. So we call the source S. It's all the way in the upper left. These rays of light are given by the red arrows you see emanating out from it. And the question is, how do we know how bright a source of light is? We know how bright a source of light is by collecting that light using an instrument. Perhaps that instrument is our eye. Perhaps it is a telescope. Or perhaps it's a solar panel. But whatever instrument we use to collect that light, we're collecting it over an area. That is, I need to have some surface that the light hits in order for me to count or collect the amount of light coming from the source. So let's imagine that I'm standing at a certain distance from my light. I'm gonna call that distance R, which stands for radius. And that radius is really kind of a radius of an imaginary sphere that extends all the way around in all directions. Where I'm standing is the surface of the sphere and the center of the sphere is where the source of light is. That's why we call this R. Um, but you could come up with this letter D or letter L, whatever letter you like to stand for distance. That R is really telling me that I'm a certain distance away from the source of light. So this light is coming from that source and it's going to be collected by something that I'm going to hold out like an area 
And there is indicated by the letter A in this diagram. And in this situation, this area is collecting, looks like just about nine rays of light are coming through this area and it's being collected there. And so if we had to give a measurement of how bright the light would be, you might say, well, I observed nine rays of light. And someone said, okay, that's how bright the source is. But if I move further away, the source becomes dimmer. And some people might ask, well, why is that? Well, what we can see is that these rays of light, they're traveling in straight lines. But when I'm standing closer to the source, I can collect more of the rays of light with the same size collecting area. I can collect more of those rays of light than with that area at a farther distance. So for example, in this diagram, we're moving two, two times further away, 2R. And when we move two times further away at 2R, you can see that that same collecting area manages to only capture three of those rays of light. So it's not half of the rays of light, which would be about 4.5 rays, it's, it's three of them. And you can see why that is. If I wanted to make an object that was big enough to collect all of the rays of light I saw at distance r, when I'm standing at distance 2r, I have to create some sort of square that's four times as big. Do you see how that collecting area is four times bigger? Well, if it's four times bigger, that means that I'm collecting about a quarter of what I'm expecting to collect at a distance 2r. In other words, I'm changing by one over the square of the distance. If I move three times further away, I only end up with one ray of light in that area. In other words, one divided by three squared is one ninth. So I'm only getting one ninth the light. Or another way to say this is that if I wanted to collect the same amount of light at a distance three times further away, as I collect when I'm the distance away at R, I would need a collecting area that was nine times bigger. Now, when we talk about this, we say that the light is nine times dimmer or one ninth as bright. But it's really a matter of this inverse square law relationship being shown here. And so th this is sort of a surprising thing when we start to look at light, that it diminishes in a way that's a lot more dramatic than what we may expect. And we'll have to use some of this back to calculate how bright light might be at different places, because it is light that is heating up, for example, our planet. The further away we get, the dimmer the source of light will be, the less heat we will receive. But what is light? The stuff that we're collecting and seeing that it gets dimmer or brighter as we get further or closer. Well, light is a form of energy. And what you can see here are a number of different kinds of energy that exist in our world. Energy was first described about 350 years ago as people began to do some calculations. And the first thing they realized is things that were moving had this sort of intrinsic characteristic to them that you could use to make calculations easier. And they called that kinetic energy. So when things are moving, they have kinetic energy, but there are things that aren't moving that also have energy. For example, a roller coaster at the top of the hill before it starts to coast down has quite a bit of energy. The reason we know it has a lot of energy is because the energy is transformed from whatever form it is at the top of the hill 
into fast motion, kinetic energy at the bottom of the hill. One of the key things that was understood and discovered about energy was that as a quantity that you calculate, it never disappears. In other words, it only changes from one form to another. And so if you do an experiment and you find that energy is disappearing, or you do an experiment and you find that energy is increasing, what is really going on is that energy is being either removed from the system and changed into some other form that you aren't measuring, or energy is being added to the system from some other form that you aren't aware of from the outside. That's the only way to increase and decrease energy in the system. Another way of saying this is that energy is always conserved. In the entire universe, we have a certain amount of energy. And that energy will change into different forms. When the energy is in one form, it might change into another form, but you'll never destroy it and you'll never create it. Energy is conserved. And this is why potential energy is a real form of energy. It's because when things start to slow down, let's say as the roller coaster climbs up the hill and slowly slows down as it loses the kinetic energy. That energy is transformed into a different kind of energy we call potential energy. Because we don't see the thing moving, sometimes people don't realize that potential energy is real. But it really is real. It's something that exists because of the position of an object in space. And the other way to describe it is that it exists whenever there are interactions that form forces between two different things. In particular, they have to be conservative forces, but we won't just go into what that means. But gravity is a good example of such a force that can cause potential energy to be stored. And it's very easy to store gravitational potential energy. All you need to do is take an object and move it to higher location, further away from where the gravity is coming. Here on Earth, the gravity is coming from the center of the Earth. So if I move anything up, it will gain gravitational potential energy. To do that, I have to put some energy into the system. Maybe I put kinetic energy in by moving it. Or maybe in the case of atoms, for example, we might put thermal energy and heat them up. Thermal energy is a different form of energy. It is actually related to kinetic energy, but it's kinetic energy at the scale of atoms and molecules. When atoms and molecules are moving faster, we say they have more thermal energy. When they're moving slower, we say they have less thermal energy. We also will consider a form of energy called mass energy. This is the latest one discovered. It's a form of energy that is associated with matter and the material in matter itself. Famously, Albert Einstein discovered that E equals mc squared. Energy is equal to mass times the speed of light squared. This is a form of energy that wasn't really understood or known about until Albert Einstein began his work looking at relativity. And now we understand that that's a form of energy that is pretty remarkable. In fact, in some ways, it's the, the largest reserve of energy that exists. But it's very hard to access that energy. It's difficult to change mass energy into other forms in our environment. If you start moving very, very quickly, and by very quickly, I mean close to the speed of light, then it becomes easier to change mass energy into other forms of energy. Or if there are reactions like nuclear reactions, uh, that can also change mass energy into other forms. But in the situation that we usually find ourselves in, most mass doesn't change into other forms of energy. And so it is kind of locked up, uh, unavailable for different processes. But what is light? Light isn't kinetic energy, it's not potential energy. It's not really thermal energy, although it can be related to thermal energy. And it's definitely not mass energy. Even though the speed of light shows up in Einstein's equation, light has no mass. It has not any way of uh, describing the um, form of energy in light as a mass. You can't do that. 
In fact, what we describe light as, um, if we're interested in its energy, is that it has wave energy. And this wave energy is something that we see not just in the form of light, but in any place we have waves. In fact, the definition of a wave in some sense is a way of transferring energy from one place to another. So let's think a little bit about waves. Waves are oscillations in space and in time. And if we measure waves, we usually measure their oscillation in space or we measure their oscillation in time. An oscillating wave in space is measured by its wave length. And that is done by looking at two different disturbances that are exactly the same and seeing what the distance between them are. We call that the wavelength. Usually we use the symbol lambda to describe wavelength. That's shown here. It looks like a strange form of the letter L. And it's in fact the Greek form of the letter L. Another way of describing waves or measuring them is to look at the disturbance in time. And we can do that by measuring the frequency of the wave, how many waves happen in a given amount of time, usually in one second. And as we look at the frequency of light waves as they pass over us, we describe how many waves in a certain amount of time there are. Let's say we saw five waves in one second. If we saw five waves in one second, then we would say the frequency would be five waves per second. Or sometimes that's just described as five per second. Uh, we don't need to say waves. In fact, it's uh, the only real unit that's here is the unit of time. But it's a little bit confusing when we describe frequency because the unit of time is in the denominator. That's very different than things we've been looking at before. So frequency could be described as one over time or time to the negative one. Units are sometimes described as per second or seconds to the negative first power. This becomes a little unwieldy. So the units are often described using a new unit called the Hertz, H-E-R-T-Z, which is described as or equivalent to one divided by a second. So if somebody says this wave has a frequency of five Hertz, that means there are five oscillations passing by every second. You'll use this sort of calculation fluency in a couple problems on the problem set this week. Now light travels very, very quickly. 299,792 kilometers per second. And as we consider light, we find that that speed that light has of 299,792 kilometers per second sets a scale for what we can observe, how far away things are, and how much time it takes for light to get from one place to another. And we can describe this using something called light minutes, or sorry, light units. Light units are the way to measure distances when the speed of light can be used as a ruler. So for example, the distance between the Earth and the moon is about 1.29 light seconds. That means it takes light about 1.29 seconds to get between the Earth and the moon. The distance between the Earth and the Sun is about eight light minutes. So it takes a full eight minutes for light to reach the Earth from the Sun. If the Sun were to suddenly stop shining light, we wouldn't know about it for eight minutes. The distance between Earth and Mars changes a lot, but kind of an average distance is about 12.7 light minutes, which means that the exploration, the Space probes that are on Mars that are being sent signals from Earth, usually via radio, which is a form of light, uh, have a delay in their processing and communications. Let's say you want to tell the rover to turn left. Well, you send the command out and it takes 12.7 minutes for it to reach Mars. Then the rover turns left and it sends back some message to Earth 
confirming that it received the command and it did what you asked. Well, it takes another 12.7 minutes to get back to Earth. Interesting thing to consider. That time delay becomes more and more pronounced the further away you get. Let's imagine that we decided to go explore the nearest star that's other than our sun. This is called Proxima Centauri, and it's 4.3 light years away, which means it takes like 4.3 years to reach that star. We know that that star actually has a planet that is orbiting around it. And that planet might have a temperature that's not too dissimilar from our own. We don't know a lot about the planet. It's very hard to observe as it's very, very far away. But we do know it exists, and we do know approximately its distance from the star. And we'll talk more about it in future discussions. But let's imagine that people got excited and tried, decided to travel to that planet. And it might be difficult to do that trip, but let's say that they were successful in some way or another. And they wanted to tell us about what that planet was like. So they send a message over the radio waves, a form of light back to Earth. Well, we won't get that message for 4.3 years. And then if we want to tell them congratulations, it will take another 4.3 years for us to reply. Any sort of exchange back and forth has 4.3 years as the amount of time it needs to take. That causes some issues with communication, as you might imagine. Now, of course, human beings have only traveled as far as the moon. 1.29 light seconds is the furthest distance we've gotten from the Earth. There are people that talk about going to Mars 12.7 light minutes away. They better be prepared to not be able to talk to anybody for those sorts of delays. But human beings have not traveled beyond the moon and uh, spacecraft haven't traveled beyond our solar system. Nothing has gone as far as even a few like days away from the sun, let alone 4.3 light years. Well, maybe in the future we will travel that far, but we will have to worry about this very effect, that there is a limit to how quickly we can have conversations. What if we wanted to travel to the other side of our galaxy? That distance is 52,000 light years. Let's imagine there might be some intelligent life form on the other side of the galaxy wanting to communicate with us. It would take their message 52,000 years to reach us. That means that message would have had to have been created 52,000 years ago. Think about what the situation humanity was in 52,000 years ago. We had just come out of an ice age. The world was perhaps not even completely populated. It's unclear by human beings. Um, there are some estimates that the um, indigenous population of the Western hemisphere didn't arrive until about 30,000 years ago. Well, they may have been here 52,000 years ago. Uh, there's still discussions about this. But certainly nobody on planet Earth had radio technology, the ability to create a signal that they could send across interstellar distances. If we're doing this now, and we wanted to signal some intelligent group that was 52,000 light years away, we would have to wait 52,000 years for that signal to reach them. And if they wanted to give us a reply, that would be 104,000 years total. That's a long time in terms of human history. It's something to think about. So I mentioned that radio was a form of light. And this sometimes confuses students. So I often will show a diagram like this that illustrates the different kinds of light and how we know what they are. Light travels at the speed of light. And because frequency multiplied by wavelength is the speed of a wave, that means if you know the wavelength of light, you automatically know its frequency. Because all you have to do is take the speed of light and divide by either the frequency or the wavelength to get the other one. 
I take the speed of light and divide by the frequency, I get the wavelength of light. If I take the speed of light and divide by the wavelength, I get this frequency of light. So here's a diagram that shows the wavelengths and frequencies of different forms of light. And one of the things to realize here is that this light, well, it has wavelengths and frequencies that vary greatly across many scales. You can see very short wavelengths, including things like nanometers and even things that are smaller than nanometers called angstroms, listed here under the wavelength at the very top. Those are associated with the highest frequencies of light measured in Hertz. You can see 10 to the 18 at the top or even higher than that. Gamma rays and X-rays are the names of some of these high frequency short wavelength forms of light. Visible light is kind of right in the middle of all of these waves. It has fairly short wavelengths from 400 nanometers to 700 nanometers. That's 400 billionths of a meter to 700 billionths of a meter. And the frequencies it shows are between 10 to the 14 and 10 to the 15 hertz. It's a very narrow range. Right outside that range, we have wavelengths that are shorter than the blue or violet part of our spectrum and frequencies that are higher. We call that ultraviolet light. And in the other direction, wavelengths that are longer than red or frequencies that are lower than red, we have infrared light. That extends fairly far down to very long wavelengths, approaching millimeters, in fact. And once we get to millimeters, we change from infrared over into radio. The highest frequency radio waves are called microwaves. And then they continue on into the radio that you know that's received by your car, for example, going all the way to long wave radio that can be kilometers in wavelength. And of course, there's also frequency to worry about as well. And the frequency of radio waves can be as much as a gigahertz, billion cycles per second, all the way down to a few millions of a hertz or even thousands or even thousands of hertz or even less than that. Very low frequency radio waves, very, very long wavelengths. But always, if you take the frequency and you multiply it by the wavelength, you get the speed of light. How is light produced at these different frequencies and wavelengths? Well, here is a diagram that attempts to show one way that this happens. If you heat any object that is opaque, that you can't see through, it will produce light. Now, at temperatures that are around us in our everyday world, that light won't be visible to the human eye. But at temperatures that are hotter, let's say than about a thousand Kelvin, and we use the Kelvin temperature scale to measure, which is the same as the Celsius temperature scale, but with 273 added on. This is because at negative 273 Celsius, all movement in atoms and molecules stop. We call that absolute zero. So we declare that to be zero Kelvin, and then we add up from there. We, uh, that's the same thing as saying that if I take the temperature in Celsius and I add 273, I get the temperature in Kelvin. Or if I have the temperature in Kelvin, I can subtract 273, and that's the temperature in Celsius. Well, if I get to thousands of degrees Kelvin, then light starts to be produced by the atoms and molecules in the opaque uh, object that I can see with my eyes. And the first form of light that's produced is red light. But as I get hotter and hotter, it becomes yellower and then even white light. And then if I get even hotter, I might even get a bluish tinge to that light. This is called black body radiation. This is 
radiation coming from opaque objects, objects that are perfectly absorbing all light that hits them. Um, we call those that color black when light is perfectly absorbing. And the radiation that comes from that object is light that is emitted by the object. We call it black body radiation. This shows you what the different colors that are possible for this. And sometimes we call this color temperature. Starting at the very coldest temperatures of 1,000 degrees, instead of the bottom going all the way up to about 9,000. Kelvin. You can see where the temperature of our sun lies. And this actually tells us why the sun has the color that it does. When you look at the sun, and don't look at it directly, but let's say if you have a camera and you can hold it up, take a picture, and you can look at the picture of the sun, you'll see that the color is about what's indicated here. When you look in children's books, they often color it a bright yellow. That's probably because a lot of people observe the sun when it's close to the horizon. And then a lot of the blue light is actually scattered away, leaving something a little bit yellower. But in fact, the color for the sun is what you see there. It's closer to sort of almost a bright white. And then as you get to hotter temperatures, you might get up to bluer lights. Different stars can have different temperatures. So while the sun has this temperature, if you had a hotter star, it would look blue. And if you had a colder star, it would look red. So looking at the color of stars is a way of telling how their temperature is. This describes sort of why that is. What we're looking at here are different objects. You could call them stars, but they really could be anything. Stars are opaque, just like on iron bar or anything else you heat it up. At different temperatures, starting at about 100 Kelvin and going all the way up to 10,000 Kelvin. And what's shown here is how much light is given off at different wavelengths. The first thing that you'll notice is that at the longest wavelengths, there's not a lot of light given off by anything. But as you go to shorter and shorter wavelengths, the amount of light starts to increase. Now, if you have a cold object, like 100 Kelvin, that's very cold. That's like something along the lines of 150 degrees below zero very, very cold, um, then there will be a peak for the light that's being produced in the infrared part of the spectrum. And then the light then kind of stops being produced at higher and higher wavelengths. And this pattern holds for all temperatures. It's just that where the peak happens will be at shorter and shorter wavelengths as the temperature gets higher and higher. So you can see 300 Kelvin is indicated here. That's the temperature of our, about a human being, uh, maybe a little bit warmer or so. But you can see that you and I, as black body radiators, will radiate a lot of um, wavelengths of light at about 10 microns or so. And then before we hit a wavelength of one micron, we basically have stopped giving off any light. If you have a device that can see uh, infrared light at about 10 microns or so, then you can detect human beings, even if it's dark, if there's no light reflecting off of them. This is the principle behind night vision goggles, for example. But let's get to higher temperatures, 500 Kelvin, that's pretty hot. That's you know the temperature of an oven. A thousand Kelvin is the temperature of a furnace, and three thousand Kelvin is sort of the highest temperature you might get in a blast furnace. And by the point we get to a thousand and three thousand Kelvin, you can notice that there are some indications that we'll start to see light in the red part of the visible spectrum. We'll see a lot more red light then we will see blue light. And that's why stars that have temperatures in the realm of between 1,000 and 3,000 Kelvin will appear red. These are stars that are colder than our sun. But once you get up to about the temperature of the sun, you notice you get almost all the colors of light, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, violet. And they mix them all together, you get white light. That's why the, the sun looks uh, sort of a brilliant white. But then when you get to even hotter temperatures, 
you can see that you have more blue and violet light and less red and yellow light. That tends to make the color a little bit more blue. And that's why hot stars look blue. When you mix all the colors up in the arrangements that you see in this diagram, and then you just look at the resulting color, this is the scale you get. And it comes from the origin of light being produced by the vibrations and motions of atoms and molecules um, producing this, we call it spectrum of light. When you show how much light is given off at different wavelengths or different frequencies, we call that a spectrum. And so this is a spectrum that's a special kind. It's called the black body spectrum at different temperatures. What you'll also notice is that there's ultraviolet light that's being produced by the sun and by hotter stars and even some colder stars. And this ultraviolet light, although we can't see it with our eyes, does affect us directly as it is something that can penetrate in some wavelengths um, through our atmosphere uh, and cause problems, uh, notably skin cancer. But this isn't the only way light is produced by matter. Another way that light can be produced by matter is through something we call atomic emission of light. And atomic emission happens when we have electrons in an atom that move from one potential energy to another potential energy. Well, in the atom, the potential energy isn't gravitational potential energy, but it's electrical potential energy because electrons are negatively charged and the nucleus is positively charged. When you get them closer together, they have less energy. When you have them farther apart, they have more electrical potential energy. So when an electron moves closer to the nucleus, it has lost some energy and it loses that energy in a very particular way. It loses that energy to light. And that light will be emitted in a very particular frequency or wavelength. This was actually discovered about 120 years ago. People were looking at how atoms formed light and they realized that light was always formed at a particular frequency whenever there were these transitions that were happening in atoms. And in fact, this is what started one of the great new understandings for how light behaved. Up till now, and until we've been discussing this, we've been describing light completely as a wave. And it is a wave, it has a frequency. But when light is emitted from an atom, it is, limited, it is, it is emitted as a packet of light. And when it's emitted as a packet, it acts a little bit like a particle. We call that particle a photon. That photon has one frequency, and that frequency is actually related to the energy that that photon has. And we can relate that energy to the frequency by multiplying by a number that people discovered when they were first doing these experiments that relates the energy of individual packets of light to the frequency that that packet has. We often measure that energy in a very weird unit. We call it the electron volt. And the electron volt can be figured out uh, by looking at how the electrons are moving in an atom or how an electron is moving through different potential energies. And we measure parts of the potential energies of uh, electricity using volts. So the electron volt could be an amount of energy that a wave of light, a photon of light might have. If you talk about single electron volts, we're usually talking about ultraviolet light. If you start to talk about hundreds or thousands of electron volts, that's when we get into X-ray light. And when we get to above thousands of electron volts, that's when we start to talk about gamma rays, the most energetic forms of light. Well, people began to study light in depth about 120 years ago, and they came up with an interesting 
understanding that if you combine this way of producing light with black body spectra, with this way of producing light from atoms, you can get some very weird results. So here, let's imagine somebody is looking at a very hot object that's opaque. If they are, they'll see a black body spectrum that's shown at the top on the left. Now let's imagine somebody else is looking at just a cloud of atoms that have been excited in some way. And so the electrons have moved to higher potentials and now have dropped down to lower ones, but at very particular frequencies. Then you'll see the spectrum in the middle on the left because different frequencies will show up and then other frequencies won't appear at all. In fact, when this was first discovered, they gave different letters to these frequencies, A, B, C, D, E, F, all the way up to K. And these letters are still sometimes used. But what if you looked at a cloud of material that was sitting in front of an opaque object that was producing black body radiation? What would you see then? Well, what's interesting is what you see then is absorption. The atoms will actually absorb the light because they'll be at low potential energy and the electrons will go to higher potential energy. And as they do that, they gobble up some of that light at those very particular frequencies. So you see what's at the bottom left here. And that view of a black body curve with particular lines taken out, that's actually what you see when you look at the sun. That's what the sun has as the spectrum of light that comes that we observe from it. Now, if you can measure those lines, you can get a very accurate understanding of what the wavelength of light is. And since we know that those wavelengths of light are directly related to atomic transitions, we can identify sort of a fingerprint in the spectrum and identify different atoms that exist in these spectra. Sometimes we see those frequencies shift ever so slightly. Sometimes they shift a little bit towards the lower wavelengths and sometimes the higher wavelengths. So we might say sometimes they shift to the red and sometimes they shift to the blue. And the reason they do that is for an effect called the Doppler effect. This is an effect that happens for all waves. And you may have heard it if you've ever heard a siren pass. As the siren approaches, it sounds high pitched. And as it passes by, it becomes lower pitched. With light, it's not pitch that we hear, but instead it's the wavelength of light or the frequency of light that changes. As an object's approaching, that wavelength kind of gets squashed together. And so we uh, see that as a shift to shorter wavelengths, higher frequencies, that's called a blue shift. So if an object is moving towards us, and we can identify wavelengths of light coming from that, we can see that they're shifted to the blue. Once an object is moving away from us, the opposite happens. The light is stretched out, the wavelengths become longer, we, saw, we see that as a red shift. This is a difficult measurement to do, but it is possible and it is done by astronomers and it becomes an important measurement for us because this is a way we're gonna measure how things are moving out in space. We can't often see them moving directly, but we can use this as a way of determining that a motion is happening. And in particular, this is gonna be a nice way to discover planets orbiting around other stars. So this is our view of light. Now, one thing you'll be asked to do would be some calculations. In particular, you'll be asked to calculate using this formula, the speed of light is equal to the wavelength times the frequency. I'll work out some sample problems for you so that you know how to do this sorts of calculations necessary to answer these questions. But realize that this is a very powerful equation. It's a way of relating wavelength and frequency to a speed of a wave. And in our situation, because light always travels the speed of light, we can always use this equation to determine the frequency of light if we know the wavelength. 
or the wavelength of being able to frequency. It's a pretty exciting thing to be able to do. So that is, brings us to the end of our discussion here. I hope you learned a little bit about light and energy. Uh, if you do have any questions, feel free to get in touch with me. But have a great evening and we'll meet again next week where we'll learn a bit about gravity.